maybe watch something light and amusing uh, on television. But it is an extremely valuable book uh, which allows you uh, to have an overview of literature as a whole as it has developed uh, in Europe from year one. And here again, you can dip into it and learn about it. And I recommend it very highly. And I hope that it gets translated in, in every European language and uh, is available uh, in electronic form so that people can read bits and pieces of it. Of course, you can't absorb the whole book uh, at once. Um, there is, since uh, the last few years also, a prize in European literature. I happen to sit on the pre-selection board. Uh, the final selection is made by the editors of the major newspapers in Europe. And uh, the prize goes to a literary work uh, that somehow has a European character. Uh, and uh, it was so difficult to choose among the various works presented that now the prize is presented in two categories, fiction uh, on one hand and essays on the other. Uh, unfortunately, there is a caveat. The evaluation of these uh, submissions requires that the work have been translated from its original language into one of the major European languages. That, of course, this whole problem of translation during the French presidency uh, of the European Union, uh, they had several conferences about the problem of translating literature uh, in Europe. Uh, we have difficulty to get our students in each of our countries to have at least essential glimmers about the highlights of the literature uh, of their own country, uh, but uh, the real challenge is uh, to get to know the really the great names in European history. And I do mean other great names apart from Cervantes and Shakespeare and Moliere and so on, so that Europeans should not be completely uncultured uh, in the cultural background of their country. The idea of democracy uh, is a product, you might say, that many consider as being an, an, a European export uh, and that uh, an export that uh, Europeans somehow try to impose in other parts of the world. Uh, and there is a resistance uh, in some quarters, uh, particularly on religious grounds, uh, that the form and the liberal form of democracy that we see, for instance, in the European Union is not acceptable to say, uh, for example, some of the Muslim countries where the Sharia law prevails uh, rather than civil law, where church and state are not separated. As one Egyptian um, presidential candidate uh, put it uh, in a conference uh, in Lebanon that the United Nations had uh, brought together, when I <laughs> made a presentation saying that one of the pillars of democracy is the separation of church and state, uh, one of these nine candidates at the time uh, said, well, th the problem doesn't exist in Muslim countries uh, because they don't have a church. So uh, there is no problem in separating church from, from state <coughs> because they only do have prayers in the mosque uh, and the thing is easily solved. Well, we saw what happened uh, in Egypt uh, with the elections and the, uh, uh, and the excessive influence uh, of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood on the presidency of uh, President Morsi, who did his best to somehow uh, lead the country, and he was elected in a democratic way, but uh, I do hope uh, that he does not uh, get too severely pub punished uh, for what essentially is uh, the whole country's inability uh, to make over the switch to democracy in as rapid and easy a way as they had hoped. I think we have some difficulties with the microphone. Mm -hmm. This will be better. I hope that those at the, at the end of the hall have heard something of what I said until now. I am not going to repeat it, so never fear. Aha, uh -huh. good, good show. Um, as, uh, as part of my work with the Club de Madrid, and this is entirely voluntary work, none of us get paid for it, uh, we try to promote the idea of understanding uh, uh, of democracy uh, as broadly as possible 
And we do not do it as political figures, not as elected officials anymore, but as has-beens. Uh, as has-beens who are completely free to express their own opinions and who are free to present what seem to us the absolutely essential fundamental elements of democracy that we would like to see spread across the world, not because of any colonial uh, or economic uh, desire on our part to impose anything whatever on others, but because it is our firmest and deepest conviction uh, that these principles have been arrived at in a very long and painful process of evolution uh, where some countries have been privileged to have access to these changes in society and in forms of governments. Others have not. My own country only was able to return to democracy uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It has been a relatively brief time of two decades in which to develop democratic forms of governance, to join the European Union in 2004, and to continue, and we see it as a challenge, to continue uh, developing forms of governance and, and the values that a democracy represents and for the whole of the European continent, the challenge, as we heard uh, from the previous speaker, uh, is uh, very acute at the moment because the belief in equality, uh, the belief in an inclusive society becomes more and more difficult if economic situations uh, create either high unemployment, inability uh, of people to look after themselves, or visible inequalities in society, which only grow larger with the years rather than narrowing the gap. The ideas that uh, democracy represents are sometimes not easy to even present to our own people who have long experience of them. And again, the previous speakers have alluded to the danger of uh, cheap populism, uh, of appeal, if you like, to the basis instincts of a population, a sort of retrenchment over its own interests and, and the cultivation of the idea that everybody else is a threat to them. Uh, but in many parts of the world, it goes deeper uh, and beyond that. And this is what we as members of the Club de Madrid, uh, in the missions that we have undertaken over the last 10 years of the existence of the club, we have tried to convey as part uh, of our, what we consider basically cultural diplomacy, since we do not go anywhere uh, without the approval of the local population, an invitation from either uh, civil society groups and always with approval uh, from the government in place, uh, such as it may be. I'll give you just a few examples of the deep misunderstandings of what democracy can be about and how much we need to engage, not just in cultural diplomacy in the sense of, say, showing our best orchestras, our ballet dancers, our opera singers, our popular singers uh, to each other, which is wonderful. We, we had... <laughs> We had Maria Naumova win uh, the Eurovision contest and uh, this brought Eurovision to Riga. Next year, uh, Riga will be capital of culture. We're very proud of that and very happy. But there are deep ideas that in many parts of the world are truly not understood and I think this is something that we as past prime ministers and, and presidents have engaged in and continue to do so. One example, when uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, through, had an overthrow um, a president that they considered uh, absolutely unacceptable, uh, there developed basically massacres in some parts uh, of the country, uh, as well uh, as an expressed desire to switch from a presidential to a parliamentary uh, form of governance. Uh, steps were taken, and as you know, Kyrgyzstan now is successfully uh, functioning as a parliamentary democracy with a legitimately elected uh, president and uh, Madame uh, Rosa Otombayeva as an interim president which saw this change. During that period, the Club de Madrid together 
uh, with the support uh, of the European Commission, had five missions to Kyrgyzstan to talk to political parties, um, civil society groups, uh, activists, ethnic group representatives, international bodies, politicians, parliamentarians, so on and so on. Uh, we did quite a bit of work uh, and uh, organized also certain conferences. At one of these conferences, at, at the mission that I was, uh, one of the missions that I was leading, uh, we were talking about democracy, and a gentleman uh, got up uh, and uh, declared uh, the following. I am a member, an elected member of the Kyrgyz parliament. But uh, your proposal that we should switch over to a democratic system, I am not sure whether it's going to work in our country. Because you see, we are um, a nomad people, a tribal people, and we just do not have the inherited gene for democracy. And he said that in full seriousness. And there are many countries where we know that uh, democracy is qualified as, say, uh, guidable democracy or, or, or uh, controlled democracy, as in Russia, uh, various qualifiers that actually diminish the impact of what a true democracy is about. This conviction that you must inherit it in your blood, of course, is pure superstition. And here we must recall, and this most Europeans need to be reminded of that, how difficult it was in Europe and how recent the acceptance of democratic. In spite of the early starts in ancient Athens, the many centuries uh, of the Middle Ages and beyond actually saw totalitarian systems, absolute monarchies, endless wars between neighboring countries right up to the Second World War. Uh, and this is why Robert Schumann, uh, a poor man who had gone through three different citizenships in his lifetime, saw this idea of finding ways where at least on that continent he could manage to stop these wars forever. This uh, is not an easy concept to understand because it takes leadership. It takes leadership to have change. We can have cultural diplomacy presenting each other. We can have diplomacy in the sense of not just presenting ourselves and arguing uh, for something, but also listening to others. Uh, diplomacy isn't just like Talleyrand said, uh, the art of telling lies in an artful way. Uh, diplomacy uh, is, is the art uh, of actually telling the truth uh, and mostly trying to find a common ground with your interlocutor, listening to them, understanding them. But I think what it does not mean is accepting anything whatever as equally valuable. I think we do have the right in democracies, in Western democracies or, or, or others, to insist that the values which we have painfully developed until now, which are not definitive, maybe uh, hopefully we'll develop them and continue to improve them as time goes on, but they're the best that we have at the moment. For instance, a respect for human life and respect for the integrity of the human body. And if somebody comes and tells us that in our society it is a cultural value uh, that uh, young girls, little girls sometimes, uh, must undergo deep genital mutilation because in our society, in our culture, it has been accepted that it makes them more pure, it makes them more acceptable brides when they get ready to get married, and it is simply an accepted cultural custom of our society, and therefore you must respect it. I think when it comes to confronting values of this sort, which are culturally entrenched, and those values which are more broadly humanitarian and do not belong to any one particular country or any one particular uh, society or even continent, then they must take precedence over the local customs. And when we are told that it is the mothers and the grandmothers who actually are the biggest proponents of, say, genital mutilation for girls in Africa, 
uh, which is, uh, and I'm not talking about the cosmetic operation, but truly about the brutal intervention uh, that causes uh, not just uh, mutilation, but death, uh, premature death in many cases. In such cases, we need leaders of opinion who must take the initiative of changing that social cultural value around. That it can be done, there are books that have been published about it, and you can find them on the internet, about how cultural change comes about. One fine example is how China stopped the practice of foot binding uh, among the aristocracy. It was very much like genital mutilation now is in Africa. Uh, it was supposed to make a woman uh, more uh, sexually desirable. Uh, a certain official foot fetishism had developed in Chinese society, and particularly in the upper echelons and among the aristocracy, with the collapse of the imperial system and the aristocracy uh, around it in a very brief period of time. When the aristocracy and the opinion leaders among it declared this is a barbaric custom, uh, this is an antiquated custom, it is an unacceptable custom which we now reject. We are not allowing our daughters to, they have to have their feet bound. Uh, we are not allowing our sons to marry women uh, who have bound feet. And within less than a generation, that practice actually literally disappeared uh, from the enormous country that is China. So this is where uh, the idea of leadership comes in. Uh, we must accept cultural dialogue, we must accept dialogue between civilizations, but we must also keep in mind universal values of humanity that belong to us all, but that are not still accepted by all. We cannot claim that they come from God, they come from people who have suffered from it, they come from people who have been tortured in the past, who have been burned at the stake, who have been persecuted in their own countries and have gone into exile. It is a cumulative, a cumulative system of concepts, of values, the value of human life, uh, the right to uh, freedom of thought uh, and freedom of expression, the right of assembly, the right to have rule of law rather than arbitrary intervention, and cutting off of heads or, or hands or feet or whatever uh, the ruler at the time uh, decides. Uh, and these are all, we could make a list of them, and they belong to all of humanity, and I think that it belongs to the leaders of those countries where they are accepted to actually present them to others, to try and persuade the opinion leaders in other countries to follow them. It is very difficult to impose something in a society where everything in it goes against it. When little girls that try to go to school in Afghanistan get vitriol thrown in their faces, or in Pakistan they get shot in the head, it means that there are very deep and profound resistances to what we elsewhere in the world would consider as an elementary aspect of humanity that all human beings from birth are born equal, they should have equal access to health care, to education, and everything else that society can provide. When we meet up with societies where these absolutely fundamental principles of humanity are denied, then I think it is not just a matter of listening in a cultural dialogue and saying, well, it's, that's how their, their, their social customs are such, uh, and we must respect them, uh, and, and, and then that's too bad. Uh, I don't think we can force people uh, to change their principles, but we certainly can encourage them, but we must do it with support, of course, from within the society. The women in any society have to somehow come to the point where the suffragettes, for instance, at the beginning of the 20th century in various parts of Europe succeeded in getting the right of vote. <laughs> And in some other parts of Europe, they only got it very recently, and so on and so forth uh, for the rights of the uh, young people uh, to find unemployment, uh, for the socially included, excluded to be included in educational systems, for everybody to have access to health care, 
to, for women to be able to go out in the street and not get gang raped, uh, just for the simple fact that they are women, etc., etc. So that leadership here is not just the leadership of elected political uh, representatives. That is important in each country, and the, the role of the citizenship in either approving or disapproving of their actions in the next elections, of course, is crucial in a democracy. But I think when we're talking about culture, we must always realize uh, that culture is not a totally relative term, that just because we label something as cultural does not mean that it is acceptable. I think we must remain vigilant uh, about accepting what are fundamental values and debating what they are, uh, even as we understand that different religions put different emphasis on what is a sin and what is not, uh, what is a proper behavior and uh, what is not, uh, and accepting these uh, cultural differences uh, within a certain scope, uh, finding them enriching and interesting uh, and so on, but when it comes down to the integrity of the human being, the human body, and the human rights to health, to education, the ability to move freely on the streets, uh, and to access all the possible uh, jobs and positions that their society offers. That is uh, the challenge uh, that not just cultural diplomacy, but I think a, a general broad movement of humanism must undertake as the task for the next century. Thank you very much.